Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Lee Sien Wong, Research Fellow of the Oxford Centre for Hindu Studies. And it's my great pleasure to welcome you all to this book launch and panel discussion on the new Oxford University Press publication, Global Tantra, Religion, Science and Nationalism in Colonial Modernity by Dr. Julian Struve, who is currently Assistant Professor of Religious Studies at the University of Vienna. This event forms part of the New Directions in the Study of Modern Hinduism online series hosted by the OCHS. In brief, the series, along with the broader research project on rethinking Hinduism in colonial India, of which it is an output, has been exploring new ways of thinking about Hinduism and colonial modernity beyond the Eurocentric reform-centered paradigm that has long been dominant in this scholarly domain. Julian's work certainly offers ample opportunities for just such a rethinking. In consonance with the basic objectives of the project, his book, Global Tantra, challenges a ubiquitous diffusionist master narrative surrounding the emergence of modernity in the Hindu religious sphere. As the book highlights, in relation to Tantra, this narrative has often taken shape in the form of assumptions regarding the exportation of Western esotericism into colonial South Asia. At the core of the book's strategy is a genealogical probing of the Arthur Avalon project, which has been so central to these assumptions. Through laying bare the various Indian and more specifically Bengali actors at the heart of the Avalon project, as well as their participation in transnational theosophical currents, Global Tantra attempts to shine some much needed light on both the indigenous agency and complex global interconnections that form the essential context in which modern Tantra emerged. Thus, as both Julian and the directors of this project saw it, the clear resonances between the overarching aims of our research project and Global Tantra made this online series a natural forum in which to showcase and engage with this exciting new book. I know that we are both delighted to have such a distinguished group of panelists to discuss the book with us today, to briefly introduce each of our discussants in the order in which they will be speaking. Uh, professor Gavin Flood is, is Professor of Hindu Studies and Comparative Religion at Oxford University, Academic Director of the Oxford Centre for Hindu Studies, and Senior Research Fellow at Campion Hall. He is also the General Editor of the OUP series, The Oxford History of Hinduism, and a Fellow of the British Academy. Uh, Professor Hans Harder is Professor of Modern South Asian Languages and Literatures in the South Asia Institute at Heidelberg University, where he is head of the Department of Modern South Asian Languages and Literatures. Um, he is the author of numerous monographs and articles on modern South Asian religious literature and intellectual history. And Dr. Bjarne Vernika Olesen is a research lecturer at the OCHS and tutor in Hinduism, Buddhism and Sanskrit at the Faculty of Theology and Religion at the University of Oxford. He leads an OCHS research program on Shakta traditions and a research program on the comparative study of religion together with Professor Gavin Flood. Um, finally, in terms of the format of today's event, each of our discussants will take it in turn to share their thoughts on Julian's work. And so with that said, I'll hand over to our first discussant, uh, Professor Gavin Flood. Uh, thank you, Julian, for uh, this, this book. So I, I've often thought that um, someone should write a comprehensive uh, account of modern Tantra and the way in which it has entered the West uh, and indeed global modernity. And uh, Julian has done that. Uh, his global Tantra is an account of, the, as, um, as Lucian was saying, of, of the modern development of Tantra in Bengal and the ways in which it has been conveyed to the West, uh, particularly showing the emergence of the Theosophical Society and its relocation to India and the regional background of Bengali Tantra, and also the work of uh, John Woodruff or, uh, as Arthur Avalon. So the book brings out different ideas of esotericism around the, uh, around, that were around at the end of the 19th century, and the rivalry between the Theosophists and other groups, which I thought was most interesting. And the Tantric occultism is particularly interesting, and Woodruff's reliance on pundits as his guru uh, along with his guru um, Shiva Chandra and um, you know I didn't know about all that and uh, I did know that he um, relied on um, indigenous pundits but I think Union's book has really brought this out it's, 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 it was a fascinating account and I love the analysis of the famous photo photograph of uh, Woodruff in a dhoti at uh, the Kunarak temple apparently he used to uh, go down there at the weekends and um, get a bullet card out to the, the temple now. So I think this is a very important book that raises questions about how traditions are, are constructed and reinvented, 
And one suspects that it's always been like that. And the ways in which Tantra became global in the wake of, of colonialism. And one dimension I particularly enjoyed in his book was an account of Western esotericism from the Theosophist to Mesmerism to um, Eliphas Levi, Eliphas uh, Levi, sorry, Eliphas Levi. Um, I used to have transcendental magic as a teenager. I remember doing a, a ritual to, to evoke the spirit of the elements, but uh, I didn't, I failed. I think I didn't have the right soul on me. But anyway, I suppose to take the, to take the, um, theme of the book for me, take the takeaway theme of that, takeaway theme of the book for me, is that all histories of religion are indeed histories and sit within historical and political contexts, as well as developing or unfolding the inner logic of their own traditions. We know about Tantra today initially because of these early enthusiasts, or we might even say devotees, and it's interesting, I was thinking how classical civilization in Greece or Rome enters the West through humanist scholarship in the 16th century, Erasmus and people like that, through to the 18th century and scholars like Winkleman. And Indian civilization likewise comes into the West through the West discovery of Sanskrit, Ernest Jones and that famous speech that everybody knows. And what's interesting about Tantra is that it enters the West not so much through scholarship, but through enthusiasm. And Avalon is, is interesting for being both a scholar and an enthusiast. But it strikes me as being different to the earlier reception of things Indian or the reception of things European in terms of the classical Greece or Rome. Only in the last half of the 20th century has philological scholarship uh, in Europe, India, and Japan, one thinks of particularly, of tantric traditions developed. And one wonders whether this would have happened had it not been for the early expounders that Julian presents. So a number of questions were raised in my mind as I was reading the book. Perhaps firstly, the, the importance of, of tantra in the history of India and in the history of the West, and in, in the uh, particularly the esoteric traditions that developed in the West and indeed globally now. And um, a question of um, once mapping and description has been done, what is it about Tantra? What is it about the Tantric tradition that continues to attract globally modern people? I, thought, I think that's an interesting question. Uh, if a, if a, a puzzling question, but it's interesting. Does it have something to offer that's absent in Europe and uh, America and indeed the global, the global world in which we live? So Buddhist Tantra, I was thinking, has, mon has a monastic infrastructure that has, been, that has translated into America and Europe, uh, but not so much Hindu Tantra because of, uh, and, and, and because of such a lack of infrastructure, uh, it is a question of whether it could have a substantiality or not, whether it has a future, I don't know, uh, in the way that Buddhist Tantrism does have a future because of the because of the infrastructure and perhaps Hindu Tantra is not as open to the same checks and balances being more reliant on individual gurus. Um, anyway, once the infrastructure of Tantra traditions has gone with the demise of royal patronage, does it become restricted to a more limited range, perhaps um, initiations, um, magic, um, taboo breaking, um, or whatever that happens to attract uh, some, um, you know, probably always a minority of the population. But I thought this was an interesting and thought-provoking book, and I thank Julian very much for, for writing it. Um, so those were my initial thoughts and questions that, that arose in my mind. Thank you so much for that, Gavin. Um, we'll hand over now to Hans. Yes, thank you, Lucien. Uh, dear, dear Julian, dear ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, um, let me begin by congratulating Julian Strube and his publishers for this brilliant book. So congratulations to Julian for this brilliant book. Global Tantra has turned out to be a beautiful and impressive publication. It's carefully edited, uh, elegantly written, yet weighty enough, weighty enough to create an impact in your hand as you hold it and no doubt on your mind as you read it. Um, as one of the 
examiners, the second examiner of what was originally a habilitation or postdoctoral thesis at Heidelberg University, I feel particularly rewarded when I look at the result of Julian's research. I remember going through drafts of the manuscript discussing ornate, seemingly never ending sentences on philosophical matters in 19th century Bengali with him, and even walking by a branch of the Theosophical Society in rainy Darjeeling, uh, where we once met a couple of years ago, I think it was in 2017. But let us turn to the book, Global Tantra. Reading just the first part of the title, any innocent reader would probably think that the fact that Tantra is known across the globe today goes back to its international transmission in the 20th century. And hence, this must be the topic of the book, a transmission we might connect with a boom in American and European esotericism since hippie times, or if we have more historical background with the mysterious figure of Arthur Avalon popularizing Tantra as occultism in the early 20th century. But this is the wrong track, of course, because as Julian Strubel's book shows us, what the book is, uh, what the book deals with is global in a, in a different way, in a, in a thicker sense. And it started being so from a, an earlier date already. The topic of the book are the public learned debates on Tantra in the 19th and early 20th centuries among several Bengali exponents of Tantric theory and practice as well as circles of reformist Hindu thinkers and activists, uh, and also, of course, theosophists. Julian's main aim is to set these debates in the Ganges Delta, in places like Nudia, Calcutta, Rajshahi, into the context of global religious history. His hypothesis is that the new public appearance and propagation of Tantra in the beginning of the 20th century revolving around the name Arthur Avalon was not as often asserted. The initial impetus that triggered a process of Tantra going global, but rather a product of a number of colonially mediated global transmissions. Based on extensive research of Bengali and English source material, Julian Strube gives us quite a comprehensive portrayal of those uh, earlier developments and thereby allows us to view the religious history of those times in a new light. Tantra, which is often understood as a residue of archaic beliefs and rituals found in various aspects of Hinduism and Buddhism, has increasingly come under criticism in the 19th century. If some parts of tantric doctrines had traditionally been deemed heterodox and transgressive already, 19th century reformism effected a further distancing from tantric traditions. They seem to be opposed uh, uh, to the new maxims of monotheistic orientation, rationalized belief and ethnic predominance that British colonialism had helped empowering. Let the tantras perish, but do not let them perish unstudied. This is what Bonkim Chandra Chattopadhyay, Bengali novelist and reformist uh, Hindu thinker, had to say on the topic uh, in a lecture around 1880. Tantra thus could still be of historical interest, but it was basically an unhealthy relic of the past to be dismissed as soon as possible as a viable religious system. This seemed to be the consensus in educated society in those days. Uh, but apparently the situation was far more complex than that. Exponents of tantric traditions, as Julian Strubel shows us, had already in the 1870s and perhaps even earlier become vocal and looked out for contacts with North American and European spiritualists. In the 1880s and after, the uh, theosophists became important brokers of tantric ideas and discussions on tantra reached many mainstream circles of Bhadralok society in Bengal. In a number of densely and yet elegantly written chapters packed with sources, Julian Strube demonstrates impressively how wide reaching the impact of tantric ideas was. Um, the most impressive to my mind is chapter number six, one of the hard pieces of the book that uh, uh, Professor Flood already referred to in a sense. In this chapter, Julian furnishes a formidable 
uh, reconstruction of the ideas and activities of one of the main protagonists of this uh, Tantra Renaissance, uh, Shiva Chandra Vidyanava or Shiv Chandra Vidyanot in Bengali. So this uh, charismatic orator and thinker had completely refused English educational institutions and become a tantric pundit. He then wrote the uh, Tantra Tattva in 1893, one of the central works of this movement, and has to be regarded as the main teacher of Woodruff, uh, Otto Bihari Ghosh, and the whole Avalon Circle. I feel tempted to make an unlikely comparison here. Um, Amitav Ghosh's novel, Calcutta Chromosome, construes a plot in quite a post colonial uh, mindset around the British colonial discovery of the malaria virus by the British medical officer Ronald Ross in Calcutta in 1897. And in this novel, uh, Ghosh fictitiously reveals the way in which the dis uh, discovery was actually instigated from behind the curtains by an obsession cult for a Bengali goddess. So Struve has not written a novel and his story has less affinities to Gothic fiction, but he tells us a similarly revealing story of backstage protagonists strong into the limelight of the pages of his book. The view changing impact of Julian's book is considerable. We have this dominant understanding of colonial history of India or more specifically of the so-called Bengal Renaissance as an age of religious reform in confrontation with Christianity, rationalism, science, and modernity, an age in the course of which traditions were sifted for utility and ethical comp compatibility, and where Tantra simply had to go. Even Tantric folk traditions like that of the bowels of Bengal got entry into the modern canon only on the condition of shedding anything smelling too much of Tantra if we think of Tagore's reception and popularization of the bowels. After reading the book, we realize that that picture was partial and that Julian Strobe has indeed managed to put the learned tantrics on the map. And that's quite an achievement. I had the pleasure and privilege to provide a few lines as a blurb for the back cover of Julian Strobe's book. And I would like to repeat one line here as my closing statement. Um, Struve makes the Tantra story more Bengali and more global at the same time. And that's quite something. So congratulations again. Thank you very much, Hans. Um, and uh, as our final panelist, uh, Biana, over to you. Uh, yes, <laughs> thank you. Um, uh, to Julian Strobe for contributing to the film. It's such a, such a great book. Um, as as Mircea Eliade once wrote in the opening pages of his classic book on yoga, Immortality and Freedom, there's no more absorbing story than that of the discovery and interpretation of India by Western consciousness. Um, but as Strobe has uh, shown in his book um, from a global religious perspective, Things go both ways, and indeed many uh, uh, weird and wonderful ways through uh, global circulatory networks of translated knowledge, amongst others, and uh, the story becomes even more absorbing. Mm -hmm. I, um, I still recall the surprise and wonder when I first went to India some 20 years ago, and everywhere I asked uh, about Tantra, uh, whether it was in uh, Rishikesh, Varanasi, Kolkata or Mumbai, uh, local booksellers and sadhus and pandits, they would always direct me towards those uh, orange books uh, on Tantra written by uh, colonial Westerner under the strange uh, nom de plume, Arthur Avalon. And this was really my first encounter with what the anthropologist Agananda Bharati has uh, termed the pizza effect or, or even the, the double pizza effect. So, like so many um, Avalon's books, they uh, mystified me and sparked an interest in both uh, Tantra and the reception history, really. So, uh, so uh, Struve's book is, is very insightful and, uh, and a rewarding read, I think. And from time to time, it amounts to somewhat of a, a page turner, perhaps, uh, which is not always the case with academic books. So when, when reading this book, I noticed that I would often say to myself, um, I knew it, 
<laughs> but, but the fact is that I, I didn't know it. I just had the sense, a hunch, that there was much more to this story, um, of which we had only learned about the, sort of the, the tip of the iceberg, it seemed, in, in Kathleen Taylor's uh, wonderful book on Woodruff, Tantra, and Bengal. And while Kathleen Taylor's book uh, is, of course, centered around Woodruff, an Indian soul in a European body, as she puts it, uh, and his accomplice, Atal Bihari Goza, um, Struga's book um, places more emphasis on the context on modern Bengal and succeeds in throwing a new light on the, on the category of Tantra itself, I think, in a global religious and historical perspective. Um, and it, it's, it seems a very difficult and, and daunting exercise, I would think, to relate these kind of microhistorical studies, in many cases based on original sources in Bengali, to broader historical developments, themes and issues, and ultimately viewing them in a global religious historical perspective, and doing so while maintaining a quite strict uh, genealogical focus. So I think it's, it's a very laudable endeavor in the context of the comparative study of the history of religions. And while, uh, while this work throws new light on historical sources and contexts and developments in the intellectual history shaping our understanding of Tantra, I think it should also be emphasized how uh, Dr. Struber's approach uh, turns uh, the category of Tantra into a kind of prism that helps us gain a better understanding of uh, current scholarly debates and perspectives on the subjects of Tantra yoga, esotericism, and religion from a more uh, meta-theoretical perspective, which is potentially very, very fruitful and rewarding, I believe. So one of the, the major insights of, of this book is, of course, that behind the work of Avalanche stood not only a whole team of people um, and all following the same guru, um, the, the Shiva Chandra, I, I didn't know that, uh, but also regional and local historical developments that can be traced back to the Bengali intervention of 1880, and uh, we should be viewed in light of the development of Bengali Shakta traditions and Shakta movements. Um, uh, and that is since the second half of the 18th century, but perhaps earlier. And already in 1974, Narendranath uh, Bhattacharya wrote a book on the history of the Shakta religion, where he pointed to the potential that much more work is necessary before we can trace with clarity these developments within Shakta thought, as well as the relationship of those developments to other sectarian orientations um, in order to, to really throw a new light on broader historical and religious developments. So there's been a long line leading up to, to this. Um, we, we know that um, ethnographic uh, surveys undertaken by Bengali pandits on behalf of the British civil servant Francis Buchanan in the beginning of the early 1800s, revealed that one fourth of the population's religion was um, unworthy of the note of any sage, as it was expressed. Um, that is, that it, it consisted of cults of mainly female village deities or Gramya Diftas, and of those uh, worthy of note, uh, one fourth were Shaktas, that is, the devotees of the goddess of Shakti. So, um, one could argue that 100 years before the, the Sanatana Dharma and the ramification of the Hindu heartland, um, um, as, as David White has suggested, around 40% of the population of Bengal were actually uh, Shakta. And uh, Bengal has, uh, of course, remained a Shakta hotspot uh, till this day. So during, during the colonial era then, from the 19th century onwards, the, the exponents of uh, this um, neo-tantric movement um, um, as to formulated as the Theosophical Interlocutors, Woodruff, and the members of Shiva Chantra's uh, society, they, they sought to reconstruct a coherent philosophical and respectable intellectual system, um, uh, variously referred to as deodorized Tantra and also as <laughs> Uh, expurgated Tantra, domesticized Tantra and so on, based on the available Shakta manuscripts um, at the time. And uh, Dr. Struga writes that uh, this is really a prime example of how different understandings of religion and esotericism were um, in a process of being produced and constantly negotiated through a global exchange and 
this was a process going on throughout the 19th century. Um, so in the case of Woodruff's project, this attempted reconstruction of um, a Shaktivada, as it has been termed, um, a Shakti viewpoint uh, was summarized by um, his biographer Kathleen Taylor as a, a subtle monistic Advaita philosophy allied to a psychologically profound ritual system with a spiritual or mystical goal and supported by contemporary Western philosophical and scientific ideas. <laughs> That's one way of summing it up. And, and Rudolf and his companions, um, they, they did manage to present Tantra as a form of Indian esotericism or, or occult science in a way that placed it in a tradition uh, with the highly respected readers and Western science. And at the same time, also pointed to some similarities with the essence of the Catholic Church, as <laughs> has been shown. Um, and in India, uh, his, his books, um, they uh, represented a reinterpretation of the Tantra tradition, which could now take its place as an accepted aspect of modern Hinduism. And, um, this is really the reason why his books are still suggested in India to anyone interested in Tantra and Shaktism, and <laughs> including me when I first went there. So uh, the, the point I would like to make is in, in relation to the research history of the field of Shaktism, uh, so encompassing both the Tantric and non-Tantric traditions, and as well as local and village traditions centered on goddesses. Um, in that this, this conflation with the notion of Tantrism from the very outset um, through the books um, of Avalon and, and the neo tantrist movements of Bengal um, had perhaps as a collateral damage that the study of Shaktism shared the same fate as Tantrism of becoming a somewhat neglected research area, uh, unworthy of serious attention or, as Douglas Brooks formulated once, an, an unwanted stepchild in the family of Hindu studies. And the Shaktism even came to be identified with Hindu Tantrism par excellence. And uh, rather than referring to uh, goddess worship, it came to denote um, the hardcore Tantra, as for example, David White is, is using uh, the term. So as, as the Shakti Traditions um, a research program has shown, we, we're still struggling with, with these definitions and entanglements of the concepts of Shakti and Tantra. And, and this has really has brought implications for our understanding of and, writings of the history of Indian religions and introductions, handbooks, companions, and so on on Hinduism. There's still uh, very uh, widely between two or three major Hindu traditions uh, with, with Shaktism taken either as an extreme subsect of medieval Shaivism as Tantra par excellence in, in Woodruff's sense, or as a major Hindu tradition with perhaps more than 100 million followers as as Jim McDaniel has noticed, uh, modern estimates of the Shakta population in Bengal, they now vary considerably, uh, ranging from 8 million to 80 million, according to, to how one defines Shakta and, and Tantra. So I'd, I'd, I'd like to, to uh, end this response um, perhaps with a quote from, from Hugh Urban, actually, who proposed uh, a study of Tantra see neither as a seedy capital of libertines and subversives, nor as an abstract set of purely philosophical texts, but rather we, we need to take Tantra, um, and, and I would then add Shaktism, seriously as a living embodied tradition with an enormous diversity of forms and variations within its many social and historical contexts. And we need, in short, to move beyond the abstract level of disembodied Sanskrit texts to present Tantra not in its ideal state, but in its lift uh, compromises and contradictions. And perhaps then we might begin to move beyond the construction of Tantrism as the exotic extreme orient, and instead as a very concrete, um, a very historical, even if rather messy and problematic category in the history of religions. And then I believe that um, this is uh, what you have done in, in, in your book and that you have succeeded in doing so. so. So thank you very much for that. Perhaps if I if I should pose a question from my side, it, it would be uh, if and how your view of the relation between Shaktism and Tantra uh, might have changed um, during and after writing this book, both uh, locally in Bengal and, and globally. 
Thank you very much for that, Bjarne. Um, and uh, now we'll hand over to Julian to give you some, you know, opportunity yeah. to, res to, to, to respond <laughs> to the comments. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for these comments. I, I'm very humbled by them and I appreciate them very much. Like I appreciate the forum you're giving me and uh, I appreciate that you're highlighting some of the aspects that actually were most important also to me. Um, it's also great to see some familiar names and even faces in the audience. Kathleen, hi. Uh, I'm, I'm very happy to see you. You uh, made this project possible in some ways by preparing the ground for uh, well, Woodruff uh, himself and his closest collaborators. Uh, I, I, I really like that, that Bjarne uh, highlighted that and I do highlight that too. And I'm very glad to see you. I hope we, <laughs> we see each other in person again as soon as possible. Uh, so I, I'll just go through uh, your your wonderful comments, and I will pick up some uh, some central points that you highlighted. I tried to make some connections between them, and uh, of course there is that first word of the title, the global. And uh, as you all know, this this whole notion uh, tends sometimes to be uh, used in a rather inflationary way, and um, there, there, there are very different understandings of what that means. So one thing that was important to me is to show how uh, this perspective of a global religious history, a, an approach that combines religious studies, uh, global history, South Asian studies, and possibly a number of other things, how that can really help us to understand uh, not only major developments when it comes to religion in, in, in the 19th century, modernity, reform, tradition, uh, all these big subjects that this lecture series also revolves around and that you're doing so wonderful work about at the center uh, in, in Oxford, um, but how that can also help us to understand what was going on in local context. And that in fact, those two levels are very often, of course, not categorically, but very often interconnected. And we need to zoom in and zoom out and, and combine these macro and micro perspectives to really understand better. Of course, we are never able to understand it fully, but to understand better how certain historical developments unfolded. And um, I think uh, that is also what helps us think about uh, what Gavin highlighted. like. The historiography of religion uh, like histories of religion are histories like we we have to tell a story we have to base our story on something and uh, i think there is now a wide agreement that we we need to decenter these stories as far as possible and move beyond this narrative of like the projection of of western religion on the rest of the world the invention of uh, uh hinduism out of nothing uh, out of uh, colonial uh, orientalist fantasies and so on. So uh, the, the, there is an importance uh, to really look in like at a context such as the, the Bengali context in its own right. And um, that will uh, yield significantly new insights. Uh, at least I, I, I hope that I kind of succeeded uh, in doing that partially here and there. Uh, of course, it is interesting to think about why Tantra was so attractive, as, as Gavin asked. And, and I think that is on one hand uh, linked to the importance, which is another point that Gavin highlighted, uh, of Tantra in itself. Uh, it's always imagine quotation mark, of course, we're talking about something very heterogeneous. Um, but the importance, especially in Bengal, uh, of these traditions that uh, can be linked to Tantra. And uh, on one hand, uh, we have on the ground uh, tantric ideas at the core of uh, uh, Indian traditions, uh, Indian practices, Indian ideas. Uh, it's nothing marginal, it's nothing primitive, it's nothing deranged. Uh, it, it carries a lot of uh, philosophical and, and, and other weight, uh, which in itself uh, means that there is a, a great value to it. It's the, uh, deserves to be studied, which is exactly the point that Arthur Avalon made and uh, the people surrounding it. Uh, on the other hand, uh, when it gets received across the world, um, and this is more on the speculative 
side or perhaps also based on a number of great studies on that like why are people so attracted to it and to focus on this question of infrastructure that that you highlighted uh, is actually an, an, a promising route because of the the focus on individualism uh, you do have something that is precisely not monastic, that is precisely not structured, uh, that is not institutionalized in the same way as, for instance, a, a Buddhist tantric order. So the, the, it lends itself uh, to a highly idiosyncratic, individual-focused kind of reception. Uh, and that is precisely what we can observe in these uh, both Indian and Western contexts. Uh, where all these uh, self-referential esotericists, occultists, spiritualists, and so on get fascinated, um, in turn, look at the subject not through the same kind of lens that we can find in missionary accounts, the most orientalist accounts, uh, Tantra as black magic, devil worship, and so on, but they say, oh, so that's occultism, that's magic, great. <laughs> But the exact opposite of uh, of, of the, the the prevalent perception. We want to learn about this, uh, and this is exactly what is taking up on the ground in India. They say, um, yes, that's true, and not only that, but it is a superior form of uh, occultism, and and that uh, means in that contemporary debate also of religion and science. This claim that you all know very well from these nineteenth century debates. Uh, the ideal religion has to be both scientific and religious. It has to be that synthesis of religion, science, of philosophy that lends itself so well to this discourse uh, around Tantra. And, and this is what also was highlighted by, by Hans and, and by, by Bjarne. Um, for instance, Hans, you um, highlighted these, uh, these interactions between spiritualists uh, theosophists uh, from all kinds of the world, in uh, all parts of the world, including uh, Bengal. And, and this is exactly the, the context in which those movements in their own right emerged or had emerged since the, the beginning of the 19th century. Debates about religion and science, debates about the, the origin of religion, the supposed Aryan uh, civilization that stood at the core of, of these Orientalist conceptions and religious studies conceptions, such, such as those uh, by, by Max Müller. Um, so from the very beginning, we have the same context of emergence uh, of spiritualism, occultism, Orientalist studies, uh, religious studies, comparative religion, uh, other academic disciplines, uh, Sanskrit studies, comparative philology, and so on. Uh, all of those revolved around these questions. And Müller is a great example of that because his concern was precisely to create, to recreate, as he thought, this, this original pure uh, synthesis of religion and science that he himself termed theosophy uh, while he had his beef uh, with the Theosophical Society. So you see how people were constantly struggling, struggling around these notions. And all that really comes in in that Bengali context. And you need to, to zoom out and, and have a look at these macro perspectives and, and try to understand the emergence of Orientalist studies, spiritualism, these Tantra movements, and so on, in like as, as being interlinked. And only then can you see all these, these con uh, uh, um, connections. And this, of course, relates also uh, to the relevance of Tantra in Bengal in its own right, uh, which is what uh, was highlighted by all of you. Like Hans, you uh, highlighted one of my arguments that we should not just look at the 20th century. I would say we should not even just look at the 19th century. We have to look at uh, the, the preceding centuries to understand what was going on in, on in Nodia. The, uh, the emergence of um, Shakta devotional philosophy, of um, Gauri Vaishnavism, of uh, like the like Ramprashad, like uh, these these kinds of very significant movements that explain the prominence of Tantra not as something marginal, underground, antinomian, but as an integral part of what was referred to then in the 19th century as Brahmanical orthodoxy. So we have to adopt this diachronic perspective. Uh, we have to look at the local context, and then we understand why it was so interesting for cultists and orientalists and, and all these different actors to look at Tantra. Uh, also, what Bjarne highlighted, this uh, talk of deodorized, uh, sanitized, 
um, domesticated kind of tantra. Uh, that's another argument that I'm more or less picking up. Actually, I'm not making this argument because I'm also not a Sanskritist. Uh, but we we have these um, integrations of Shakta philosophy of other parts that, as you point out, very problematically are just subsumed under tantra. Uh, already, like in Aminava Gupta, like 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 a thousand years before that, uh, and we have all the debates resulting from that, and and we have in 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 Nodia and other parts of Bengal this integral in integration of, of, of the tantras in, in Sanskritic Brahmanical learning and so on. So it's not just a modern deodorization of something that has been previously rejected and, and that was underground. Uh, we have these debates that also were highlighted by, by, by Hans, uh, the reformers, the so-called. And one of the, the points I try to make is that there is no clear distinction between so-called reformers and so-called revivalists or orthodox or traditionalists. The situation is so much more complex and, and you can really use theosophy as a great example of that. Um, how these, these theosophists were really perceived as revivalists, for instance, while they were Westerners, like at least initially come, dominated by people coming from the West. Uh, they were advocate, advocates of, of female rights, so they, they founding girls' schools. Uh, they, they used modern and uh, they praised modern and progress and science in every single sentence, sentence they uttered. Uh, so it's not just like a, a, a traditional orthodoxy or something like that. It's something that was negotiated in India and in Europe. Uh, you have similar debates in, in Europe going on, in, in North America going on, which is another reason why you sh why I don't find it helpful to think about like the export of the European understanding of religion or of science into the rest of the world, because in Europe nobody or perhaps more accurately, everybody thought that they knew what religion and science means, but they disagreed on that. There was no ready-made expert of religion or science or modernity that could have been just transplanted from Europe to the rest of the world. Uh, and, and this is something we can understand particularly well when we look at these diachronic uh, developments in, in Nodia and elsewhere. And then we find someone like Shiv Chandra or Shiva Chandra, who um, is often presented as this traditional pundit uh, learn, trained in classical learning, and then uh, you discuss sixth century tantras to explain Shiv Um, Whereas at the same time, we have someone who takes Woodrow as his disciple, uh, who on one hand rails very polemically, and I love your reference, Hans, to our non and endless sentences. <laughs> you were referring to his sentences. He was a great orator, so he had this extremely colorful language. Um, and he was railing using that language against modernity and, and Western influences and so on. But at the same time, he had he was writing in Bangla, not in Sanskrit. And then he had, he had his main work translated into English <laughs> by uh, the Avalon team. And many more examples could be given that I discuss in the book. So these categories don't help us much. They help us as um, a starting point because they are there, period. They use, they're used in the 19th century, but uh, we have to untangle them and, uh, uh, and see um, where, in what context they emerged and they were constantly debated. Um, and this is something I, I appreciate also that, that was highlighted um, that I'm not only, quote unquote, discussing these historical sources uh, in, in Bengal and elsewhere, but I do try to make a, a small modest contribution to these ongoing debates, as you highlighted, Jana, um, about how we can perhaps write about religion, uh, avoiding the trappings of both these uh, uh, old Eurocentric um, models, and on the other hand, also some tendencies uh, from the other spectrum, uh, the end of the spectrum from uh, people who might be inclined towards post-colonial perspectives, uh, who tend to overemphasize, um, like for instance, cultural appropriation, um, Western oppression, uh, and thus end up also focusing on white Westerners doing stuff. Uh, rather than looking at uh, local context and see that these people were, of course, not just passive recipients of every, uh, anything, and, and, but they contributed to these debates, despite 
the, the, the extremely relevant power asymmetries that we have in the colonial context. So there's a lot of traps and, and, and a lot of fine lines to walk. And I'm sure I, I sometimes probably messed up with that, but I tried my best. And uh, I hope that some of the, the insights can stimulate these more abstract, uh, more general discussions. And uh, of course, there are many lacuna, including those that were highlighted by Bjarne in the end. Um, for instance, uh, my focus on textual sources, on a certain intelligentsia, uh, on the Podorok, uh, on, 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 on pundits. Uh, and indeed, uh, in order to paint a more comprehensive picture, we would have to move beyond text, be, move beyond disembodied abstract context to, to incorporate uh, anthropological field work, all these kinds of things that you are doing. Uh, and, and other aspects as well. Uh, so I hope that there will be more exchange on that in the future. And I, I thank you very much uh, for, the, for this feedback. I hope I didn't forget something super important. Please bring it up if I did. Uh, I thank you for your time anyway, and I, I appreciate the invitation so much. Thank you. <laughs>